What's up, dog? Yo. Why are you sleepy? I'm sleepy because I've played that game again, Total War. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. No, it's... How much have you slept in the last four days? Uh, probably average of five a night, I would say. Wow. This yeah. Invest in banking hours, dude. Yeah. Uh, maybe five to six. It's is that, bad. Is that time in bed or time that your aura ring says you've slept? Time that the aura ring says I've slept. Oh, that's pretty good. It's a little bit more time in bed. That's pretty good. But actually, the uh, it's made me want to care more about sleeping because I've always been a night owl and it it has really shown a light on how bad things can get if you don't sleep are you i feel noticing? i feel cognitively disconnected. i was gonna say are you noticing yeah. sleep dep deprivation effects what's worse is i didn't notice them yesterday and i knew i was suffering them today i, ha I got seven hours last night yeah and so as you get closer to actually normal you become aware yeah. of the fact that you're slow i told you james clear is the one who told me this said he, what he said that they did a study and when you are sleep deprived the worst part is you don't know you're sleep yeah. deprived. So you think you can drive fine. Yeah. You think you can take a test fine. But when they show you, you're, they take math tests when you're sleep deprived and when you're not. And you yeah. do way worse. And yeah. people are like, it's just bad luck, man. It's I'm not. Luck. I'm fine. Like, they I, fight it. I only they fight noticed it in Smash. I was like, why am I slow? Why did I walk into that? Yeah, why yeah. did I? Like, we were playing video games. I was like, something is not happening I'm here. supposed to be good at this. <laughs> And then today, I'm aware of the, the ways in which I'm falling. But that means that I'm one night away, I think, from, yeah, yeah. from coming back. But anyway, it did make me think about sleep, the importance of it. And I heard uh, Sam Ovens talk about it, and I think it's true. People often focus on diet and exercise. In mm -hmm. his mind, and I'm becoming increasingly convinced, the area that most people could do the best to optimize their performance is actually in their sleep is in getting enough sleep and getting the right kind of sleep and in tracking it because you've seen this you put that aura ring on dude yeah it's weird so i was like you don't want eight hours of sleep at night yeah so i'll just go to bed from 1 a.m to 9 a.m what i didn't realize is that that is about six and a half to seven hours of sleep yeah because there's a solid hour of rolling around or going to the bathroom or you don't fall asleep right away mm -hmm. so in my head i was like i get eight hours all the time it's yeah like, you have never gotten eight hours since you've gotten this ring and you don't realize like late night screen time versus not you get a first-hand experiment you took a drink i know one night you had a glass yeah, yeah. of wine and you watch your resting heart rate go up by 30 yeah. <laughs> percent it's just it's like, crazy you still sleep yeah. but your heart normally my heartbeat falls to like mid 40s yeah all of a sudden it's in the mid 50s mine was in 60s yeah. dude resting heart rate was in 60s that means things are not good <laughs> and so i actually really like the ordering from the perspective of what's get what gets measured gets managed yeah totally so i'm gonna work on that sleep is the is the next frontier i think for me nice. to finally go to bed at a reasonable hour so yeah i'm a bit tired but i do have some good notes for you nice not too many though we talked about this dave Chappelle, critical mm. divide joe rogan shown some light on it yeah shout out to joe rogan this is why i saw it's this it's funny well the bigger thing with that i thought about that is that joe so let's say what happened so what happened is that rotten tomatoes is the aggregate of all the reviews a few days after the Chappelle special came out they had five critic reviews that were in all five were rotten. It had a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, and they hadn't opened audience scores up. Mm -hmm. So it just a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, and, and the criticism was that this is racist, misogynistic, homophobic, whatever bad thing you can be in 2019, yeah, yeah. it was. And then they let the audience review it, and both because people liked it and as a reaction to that, it has a 99% yeah. on, on audience. Which is insane. Yeah. And so since it's gone up to 23% positive well, they let critical in, reviews. There's now 13 yeah. critic reviews, which is weird because normally there would be, I think, it would it's, be it's unlocked. Also, it's a comedy special, which is the thing. So maybe, may, I don't I'm know. Saying that, you normally you don't lock, I think, a Rotten Tomato review to only certain reviewers. They picked five reviewers that they knew were going to pan it. Maybe, maybe. It's also possible that not a lot of people reviewed Dave Chappelle's comedy special on Netflix. So you can't necessarily ascribe it to Rotten Tomatoes. What is, I think, undeniable is that there's a disconnect <laughs> between the audience reviews as represented by whoever is signing up for Rotten Tomatoes to do that yeah. and the critical reviews. I want and to see how many people have reviewed it. So uh, my first thought was, one, Joe Rogan has so much power. Yeah. And, I, and I think there's a story behind the story here which is, at the end of the day, this is awesome for Netflix and Dave Chappelle. A couple critics don't like it. This only gets him more views. If, if there's a single individual out there who read the Slate.com review and went, whoa, not going to touch this homophobic comedy special, like, that didn't happen, ever. Yeah. It only got more people to watch it. What's incredible is that Joe Rogan created a reaction to that that got all of these people additionally to go to Rotten 31, Tomatoes. 31,000. 
I think there's a landscape shift, and we talked about this when Bernie went on Joe Rogan, and I think you're going to see it. This uh, We mentioned the New York Times article where they painted him as dark web. He's got power. He has power in a way that Slate.com doesn't have power, that The Atlantic doesn't have power. He can move bodies and change opinions. And I think that establishment, anything, this, there's a lock into the status quo. So he represents a threat to any kind of status quo. And I think that you're going to see separate from Dave Chappelle, tension there and discrediting going on of him because he is just such a powerful platform and could, quite frankly, influence the 2020 election in a massive way. What's funny is that he does not want to. Yeah. So in that same clip yep. where he talks about Dave Chappelle, the guy's like, yeah, man, this is why we need you. This is why we need pioneers that are yeah. getting neutral news. And Joe Rogan spends a solid minute just being like, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> I want to do comedy stand-up shows. I want to do the UFC and I want to occasionally talk to cool people. Yeah. I have no interest. Don't come to me. This isn't my thing. Weird. And I thought that was really interesting because it's like, sir, you have all the power. Yeah. You could be the news for a generation. Yeah. You can control elections. Yeah. And he's just like, I really, really don't want to do it, guys. Weirdly enough, I think that's why he works is because everyone else wants to. They want to influence your vote. They mm -hmm. want to drive you in a certain direction. And it's become so patently obvious when you when you when you get any sort of perspective on anything nowadays so to have someone who just wants to ask bernie questions that he cares about but isn't necessarily trying to move in one direction strongly at the beginning of the interview is powerful mm -hmm. and i think he's built up credibility in a way while a lot of more mainstream things have started to throw it away uh, and it's just interesting. I mean, we grew up in a time where you trusted to a greater degree oh, yeah. networks and things that you. I thought Trump was crazy when he said fake news. Yeah, it's like it's not fake news, dude. Yeah. The news is the news. The news is the news. It's also funny to hear people talk about. They talk about objective news as if such a thing could possibly yeah, yeah. exist. I think that's a that's a misnomer. One of the things that I do appreciate about someone like a Ben Shapiro is that he says, "I have a bias. The best thing that I can do is to reveal my bias to you." Because humans are incapable, I mean, just definitionally, of taking an objective standpoint, which yeah. is kind of a God's eye perspective, which no one can do. You have to view it through the lens of your eyes and ears and no, life. The and stories you choose to cover, your bias will bleed into. Instantly, right? You're not writing stories about ants. That's a bias. <laughs> you know, like, there's a lot going on in the ant world right now that you aren't covering. The bees. There's a what genocide. About the bees? There's a genocide right now. No, but even inter, inter ant dynamics, just simply focusing on humans is a bias, right? So news that isn't biased makes absolutely zero sense. You just have to try to be as transparent with what is important to you as a journalist as you can, so that people can keep that in mind as they as you know sift through the things that you are incapable of untangling your bias from but anyway dave Chappelle, man i don't even know what to make of I it i like that he called it ahead of time he in, said what? in his special he goes and for those of you that are offended just remember you clicked my <laughs> face on netflix like he just calls it out yeah because he, he knew it was coming yeah it's angel it, have you seen it i i've seen clips but i have not seen the whole thing no Oh man, I would have I would have been I'd really curious what opinion. your opinion was. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll watch it and come back next week. Yeah. Okay. Let us know. Uh, so that it's what is fascinating to me. What's fascinating to me is that the job of journalist, obviously, gets a specific type of person to do it, which means that you know if you're going to interview a group of investment bankers, they're going to have commonalities that you wouldn't expect from the general population. Mm -hmm. What seems to be occurring with journalists versus the general population, at least as represented by the people who voted on the Dave Chappelle special on Rotten Tomatoes, which isn't perfect, is that there is a heightened sensitivity to power dynamics amongst journalists and a decreased interest in humor. And then you go to the other reviews, because I was just reading some of them, and I read some of the critical reviews, and it, it said nothing about if it was funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was only that he defends powerful celebrities and takes advantage of the weak and, and isn't making the right type of joke, not if the joke is funny or not or mm -hmm. makes you laugh. And the other people are writing that they laughed. So it's, it's just interesting that that would be a divide in the types of people that move into journalism. I don't know what to make of it, but— you know, well, I mean, I know. think we're coming. There's a there's a battle coming mm -hmm. for the for the public opinion. Yeah, if that makes sense. There's, it's and it's heating up two sides. It's right. Heating up. Yeah. And there's the side that thinks that things are 
bad because there's too much hate in the world and they want to have hate speech policed aggressively and you can't say anything negative about any minority groups anyone who's ever been disenfranchised you must protect those groups and it's getting more and more and more protected right and there's another group of people that feel like that's gone too far mm -hmm. and that people are being sensitive and that there should be freedom of speech and they're getting they're getting frustrated with the amount of protection that is being given to people at the expense of truth let's say yeah in their minds yeah i don't know who's gonna win but i know people on both sides and each of them is getting more fervent yeah. as time goes on. The people who feel like they're, there's a disrespect to certain groups think it's worse than ever. You know, they yeah. they cried when Trump was elected and they think things have only deteriorated from there. And there's there's a lot of anger and a lot of sadness and a lot of fear. And on the other side, there's a lot of frustration, a lot of perceived slights against them being assumed that I'm bad because I'm not one of these protected groups. Yeah. And they're starting to get really pissed off at being told that they're the bad guy just because of the way they look or whatever. Yeah. And so it's interesting because I've noticed no matter- Do you know people on both sides of yeah, that? sure do. I would love to sit one on that couch and one on this couch and talk to him. I would love that too. <laughs> so the one, the one I can think of is definitely not going to do that because he's a pretty successful finance guy. And so he just wants to stay out of the spotlight and do his job sure. and make bank, you know? Which side is, I mean, I could guess, which side is he on? Oh, he hates the censorship and he sure. thinks- people should be able to tell jokes and okay. all that stuff. Got it. And and it, what about the other side? Could we get that person on here? Probably. I could probably find somebody sure. who thinks that. Because I, I certainly, when I watch You want Dave me to find someone who thinks that the Dave Chappelle special is bad because even if it's funny, you shouldn't make jokes or, or about Or that it's not funny. Yes, you, you shouldn't make certain types of jokes. I'd love to talk to I someone. I Because I, like I don't feel like that. I feel, there were jokes that I was like, eesh, but also, I might not agree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say. Who not to the it? death. Well, I think it might have been misattributed to Voltaire. Yeah. Um, or maybe it was Voltaire. But in any event, I wouldn't actually defend to the death because I'm a coward. <laughs> but <laughs> you can I, win. I will get on a podcast and yeah. say that you should. <laughs> uh, so I would love to have that conversation because I, I admit to not really being able to capture – the essence of the other side. I, I don't understand it. I think it comes down to the belief that words create violence or even that words are violence. And I don't understand it is, is my honest feel. And I would like to. So if, if somebody who could be a good representative of that would, would get on, I would like to talk to them. All right. You gotta, I got to do It's tough, man. I got to find someone that thinks that and is as smart as you because I think you could take either side and win just because you're really good at. Uh, I will not try to win. I will try to ask questions. Okay. And crush them. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're a philosophy major. Your brain, your brain is honed for finding. Yeah, uh, for finding logical flaws arguments. in arguments. Sure, sure. But I'll try to find. I'll, I'll make it my goal, quite frankly, to find the holes in both sides because I think. We need a very left leaning philosophy major typically when you have large groups of people that believe either thing there's elements of truth in either side and, yeah, I, and I, I see both sides yeah i believe that to be the case and i i can i can see how saying mean things can create such an internal environment in another person that it is hostile in a way that hitting them could be hostile mm -hmm. um so i'd love to talk to them about the boundaries and that kind of stuff but just interesting man it's it's going to heat up it's only going to get worse i see it have to I'm, just, I'm assuming, I have no idea how it's going to end. You know, obviously you have certain. The election is a proxy for it, man. Yeah. The election is a proxy for it. This is kind of what your people are taking sides, and it, and it becomes a political divide, and not just a. This is maybe a decent segue. Whoa! <laughs> the book that I'm reading is about how how I, I'm still reading it from last week. It's called The Righteous Mind. I know that people have been asking me to say the books I'm reading, and it's about in part how differences in temperament create political differences and mm -hmm. what appear to be political differences are actually just differences in what you value. So conservatives will value tradition, cleanliness, uh, orderliness more than liberals who will value caretaking, you know, caring for the feelings and, and the experiences of others. And they define uh, fairness differently. And we are experiencing this. People who tend to fall on the liberal spectrum define fairness as generally being equal. And people who fall on the conservative side, at least of the American political spectrum, define it as being proportionate to what you put into a system. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned this. You see that with they are – they will advocate for veterans because they feel that veterans – Conservative people. Yes. Because they've paid their dues. They have put into, they've put into the group. And they deserve society And they deserve to take proportionally care to take care out. 
versus if you care more about caring and you go, well, those people fought in a war and they hurt other people. So they should get the same equal thing. Like you, you just get very different mm -hmm. outcomes depending on your values, which is fascinating. Um, the other thing that it talks about, which is, eh, even though it's the same book, a weirder segue, <laughs> and that I wanted to ask you, is it talks about how evolution, how morality is essentially, it's, it's just an evolved way to control one another and keep going, right? Because we, we need to coalesce as a group, and you're going to have different moral standards evolve in different things, just like different skin colors will evolve in different environments. Different mm -hmm. moral norms, they're not written in stone. They, they are to protect a type of society that grows up in a particular environment. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is there's been massive shifts. There's been a technological shift. There's been the Industrial Revolution. So our morality is rapidly, almost like a comet hit planet Earth, forced to evolve to a rapidly changing thing. And I'm getting to my point. But he, <laughs> he gives the example of, have you heard of the foxes in Russia that have been domesticated? No. So some guy in the 50s or 60s takes a group of wild foxes, and he just hard pressures natural selection, meaning he picks the friendliest ones from each generation and breeds them, breeds them, breeds them. Breeds what does them. he do with the non-friendly ones? <sighs> Who knows, man? Just kills <laughs> it's Russia. Just a <laughs> slaughter fest of foxes. I have no idea what happens. And maybe they just go out in the woods. But he, he keeps them and creates them, you know. And 60 years later, they're domesticated. Now, they're not as friendly as a dog, but they'll live in your house. They won't bite you. They'll, they're domesticated. And that's in 60 years, not a ton of generations. Point being, when you put hard evolutionary pressure on something, you will get dramatically different results in a short period of time evolutionarily. So it might have taken millions of years with the planet can take less time if there's hard pressure. So my question to you is, what shifts do you think in our society are being selected for today with the world that we live in, and that's a big question. It could be the types of dating that's happening today. It might be uh, the types of things that make people successful and more likely to procreate. I'm curious, because I didn't know the answer, but we've undergone, as a species, a lot of different shifts. And I'm curious, before it might have been like, me, ugh, me, strong. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, my wife now. And today, it's I don't think that as much. Well, what's the metric? Because if you're talking evolution, then the goal is to procreate, right? So to I would survive. guess I would yeah. guess that being religious is the best thing because it leads to the most mm. kids. It might be because I know a lot of smart, successful atheists who are going to go have like one kid. Yeah, you know, versus somebody who is going to have eight kids. If I you think... just if you play that out for ten generations, you're going to get crushed by the people that are having eight kids. Yeah, and I think that tends to be people who are more religious. Well, I think you raise a good point because the, perhaps the biggest thing to happen to evolution is contraception, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Man, I don't know if there's ever been a more yeah, I get to watershed and event a baby. and choose to not have a baby. Yeah. So if there's a class of people that go, well, we're not going to do that or we're not going to abort them or we're not going to, you know, condoms are bad or... Yeah, yeah. If you have a group of people, you have a group of people <laughs> who just says, I'm not going to use birth control, I'm not going to use condoms, <laughs> and they're, they're going to win. Yes, and a amount of In 100 sex, years, they're going to win. So it's it's just interesting to consider yeah. from that perspective. Dude, to be fair, I mean, I made it 32 years without having a kid, and we know somebody who's 14 right now and pregnant, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> from an evolutionary standpoint, she's probably going to get pregnant again. Yeah. She's not going to stop at 14, yeah. right? And, she's uh, not 14. She's like 16. Okay. Yeah, but you get uh, yes. She's gonna win. Yeah. When we look at the amount of kids mm. I have and the amount of kids she yeah. has, she's probably gonna have a higher number. Exactly. And whatever is going on in her life experience that is contributing to that mm -hmm. is likely to do it. Now, there's still evolute because we converse via language. There's still a battle of ideas. So she's gonna get her daughter, mm -hmm. which might grow up in her household and have her religious beliefs, can still watch my YouTube videos, mm -hmm. and that can influence her. And then maybe she goes, "Well, no, I'm not gonna do what my mom did. I'm gonna take. I'm control. gonna take." So, so there's this weird. There's these pressures coming in evolutionary from a lot of different things that are no longer just genetic. And I haven't had the time to sit through and think of all of the interesting implications of it, which I'll maybe next week have some takeaways. I was just curious what you thought if there's, I think religion is, is an interesting one. I also think, well, I was going to say intelligence, but to your point. Well, it depends what you're scoring for. It. There's, who's dim accumulate, there's diminishing returns gonna, on intelligence. Who's going to accumulate the most wealth? I would bet on IQ. Yeah. Who's going to have the most humans with the same genetic material as yeah. them 200 years from now? Not, not probably the smartest. I'm not betting on IQ. Yeah, it's, it's. There's, there's probably I'm something to that find is more a, predictive. Uh, 
Honestly, I wouldn't even go religious. I'm trying to find just like a really reckless, handsome guy <laughs> who has no regard for STDs, doesn't feel any obligation towards his children. Yeah. That's my bet. That he's, guy. And he's just going to go forever. And he's just, just going to keep banging people and then fleeing the city. He's getting out of just there. Just eschewing his responsibilities. Yeah. And he'll have j just a hundred people. And, and what's different compared to, you know, a couple thousand years ago is that guy existed. But guess what? His kids didn't make it. You know, like, like, okay, he existed, he was out there, he did all that, but if he didn't pair bond, a lot of those kids didn't do very well out in the wilderness with just mom. Yeah, if no one else was or, or yeah, or... like, or, or maybe even wilderness, even post-agrarian, like, just mom trying to earn an income, those aren't the healthiest. Yeah, in the 1800s. Exactly. That's a, that's a rough hand, single mother. But if that guy can go and, and there's enough of a social welfare program that, that those kids grow up to be healthy, happy, productive members of society, yeah, maybe that becomes the thing that evolution begins to select for. Just I wonder if short sight is there a gene for short sighted? Wonder, <laughs> maybe just short sighted is what's gonna win. But only short sighted in particular areas, because if you might not make it to reproductive age if you're sticking a fork in the socket, you know? If yeah. you're going, Oh, I wonder what this does, like that could that could end you. So there's these interesting balances on either side. The Perhaps one of the most interesting things from it, though, is that it really convinced me, not that I was, I was pretty, people aren't going to like this, that I'm kind of a moral relativist. I don't think that you can stand on, so if you have two different uh, concepts of morality, let's say that you have a... Uh, Do people not like this? Isn't this pretty... Like, no, like Sam Harris, for instance, is very anti-moral relativism. He will say... So moral relativism, just so people know, I'll, is, I'll, is yeah. the idea that there's, there's no... Objective. absolute morality yes the morality is just based on some confluence of events and historic tradition and stuff like that but doesn't the world even just show that like morality is different but, in every but sam country. harris would argue that his morality Western is right. values are not our right are better and lead to human flourishing in a way that is for instance he often compares it to islamic sharia law or something mm -hmm. like that that and he tries to build uh, an edifice from where anyone could arrive at that answer. And I think that's a fruitless, I don't, like, the ground on which you have to stand in order to say that this Western thing is better must presume Western values. Mm -hmm. But what this book does is show me is that, listen, there's values of, for instance, that you might have in a Sharia law, which is community cohesion, you know, tr adherence to tradition, which we just do not care about. Mm -hmm. we, we think that harm is the ultimate thing. Is someone being, is their freedom being limited and are they being physically restricted? That's, that's the metric by which we judge is, is a moral program good. But that's baked into this. It's not necessarily baked into this other mor moral system to the same degree. So to grade this moral system on how many people are harmed or have their freedom limited sure. is to stand on this ground and then look down on this other morality and he and every moral philosophers tried who who fights moral relativism has tried to say no 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 i'm not standing on western grounds i'm standing on objective grounds that you can get to through pure human reason yeah yeah i find that very unconvincing and this book is has taken me farther down that has anyone has anyone ever disproved the golden rule disproved like or as the golden rule not just the ultimate standard of morality uh it depends what you value what if so what if you value just you getting ahead <laughs> you know then you guys just be nice to me and i'll treat you however i feel well, that's not how they would that's not how that's not the goal that's a misapplication i know that's rule. what i'm saying that's what i'm saying it's like you're saying isn't the golden rule great i'm saying well if my if my moral landscape is screw everyone else only me then the golden rule is doesn't work very well because i want you to treat me differently than i treat you i want to exploit you well you're just not willing so you're not willing to follow the goal <laughs> that's what you're saying yes that doesn't disprove it you're just going no i don't want to well, follow what that. do you sorry what do you mean disprove so you're saying some people believe in western values some yeah. people believe in sharia law some people think you should wear a certain clothing because yeah. of god some people say but like isn't it pretty universal you should just treat people the way that you want people to treat you no. Uh, for instance, uh, I mean, you could only women have to wear a hijab. So I'm saying where <laughs> they where they would fail this is in their definition of people, right? They they think that men and women should be treated differently. Have have there's different morality. Sure. You literally have a moral. Well, then and then they would distinguish men different than I'm women. Not, so let's right? let's move away from Islamic so it doesn't get too heated. But you go back in time, you look at Hammurabi's code which is one of the first it was Yeah, eye on for an rock. eye, but only uh, if you're at the same class. Yes. Yeah. It's yes. So 
we treat each other the same. But I don't our think a lot slaves, of people realize that. Yeah. Our slaves get treated differently than we get treated, and as do and there's all different kinds of people. There's people that you've captured but aren't totally slaves. There's your pure. The, these were people who were born into slavery. There's there's women who are in a third class completely. So. Sure. Golden that, rule, assuming that all humans count as humans. And then what we're trying to do is expand that golden rule in some ways, even beyond yeah, species, yeah. right? To go, hmm, maybe it's not so nice to to, to lock a cow in a cage so that you could eat it in a well, few years. Well, you think years. that, but then you keep telling me to lock my dog in a cage. So where's your... <laughs> so where? Where really? Morality. Where do you lie on this morality? <laughs> won't fair. eat a cow, but you I'm won't a cage speciesist. a dog. I'm a speciesist. No. <laughs> but you're right. You're right, is that... People generally follow the golden rule, except that they, they just define. shrink and yeah. expand the people that that applies to, right? Oh, my family are the only people that matter, but my neighbors, screw those people. So, yeah, man, it's it's just shown me how morality evolved like an eye or like a hand, and it serves a purpose, which is – and he – which is group cohesion, you know, is, is, to, is to make things work. Yeah. This is a C transition, <laughs> but I'm going to get us off of this because I sure. – I, I, It's uh, gone deep. I had an interesting experience recently, which was I had a scam call that I actually picked up because it didn't say <laughs> scam likely. Yeah. And oh, you have a scam likely? Is that an iPhone X thing? Yeah, my phone just says wow, scam likely. Wow, yeah. I'm on the 7. No, it's nice. <laughs> it's real nice. But there was, it was a, a woman who sounded very nice who wanted to help me with my unsecured loans, of which I don't have, Yeah. and just wanted to steal from me. Yeah. And normally in my world – most people actually value integrity very highly in my friend group. And mm -hmm. then even in the times in business where I've potentially had someone try to screw me, they didn't think they were stealing. They just had a more loose definition of honesty or what's fair. But this was a person who was just straight up like, I'm comfortable taking money from you and stealing it. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize, yeah, not everyone has the same morality as you, but also not everyone cares about following morality. Not everyone is measuring their integrity. Yeah. Some people are just going... I'd like money. I'm going to randomly call people and see if they have money. And then I'm going to lie to them to try to get that money. And that was interesting. It's like, yeah, not everyone is moral. Not everyone is even considering here's, the, here's what's crazy is that this person has a code. I sure. guarantee you they have a code. Sure. And there are lines that they won't cross. So what's weird is if you can step out of your moral standpoint, which is lying is bad. It being well, I guess this was good. my point is that ev is that to, everything is on the table for some people. There are people that will just – Murder you for your money. For some people. But there's something that guy wouldn't do, maybe. Sure. Which is to say, weirdly enough, everyone is moral, which is crazy. They just have their own culturally informed, arbitrarily applied <laughs> thing, uh, thing that they do. So what we've been working on to transcend that a bit is to try to step out of our self-interest and to know that we're making strides perhaps in a slightly better direction when we are doing things that aren't fun. <laughs> well, this is probably a good time to tell you this. I actually am going the other direction. So <laughs> I called Charity Water and I was like, hey, don't cash that check. <laughs> Give it uh, back. <laughs> I'm going to need that back. I saw a really nice watch the other day. Yes. yes. So I'm going more. That's basically after talking to this woman on the phone, I realized that I could do more for me. I could do more for me. Yeah. And it wouldn't matter. And there's no so, objective scorecard by which that and, woman will be judged harsh, I did help her with my unsecured loans <laughs> as a thank you for that lesson. I've often thought it'd be funny to have a, I guess it's kind of like that Jim Carrey thing where, where he just says yes to everything. Have you seen the TED Talk? No. Someone gets a scam email. Yeah. And I don't know why oh, this I've is seen a TED this guy. Talk. He, yeah. But they were like, I'm going to see where this goes. Yeah. And then they're emailing back and forth. He goes, hey, I, I want to get this. I want to get the Saudi prince's money just like your promise hurry i'm gonna give you my bank account soon but my boss is on to me we gotta start using code words <laughs> yeah so like instead of saudi thing. prince yeah. say like goat king or whatever yeah. and instead of money say milk yeah and so then the guy's writing like some whoever the scammer is is like the goat king needs your milk for <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like he just went and he's like how far can i push this guy really far is the answer yeah that's amazing he really wanted your bank account information <laughs> and he was willing to email you weird stuff i gotta go quick my boss is on to me he's gonna catch us so we got the evolution. This one is uh, semi-related. I watched a video on Reddit that made me appreciative, and it's a little bit graphic, so I will describe it. But if you don't like, I'll keep it as ungraphic as I can. It was from Nature is Metal subreddit, mm. and it was a group of lions on a wildebeest, mm. two of them at its throat. One of them flat bit its balls and ripped them off. Mm. And presumably shortly after, ate this entire wildebeest mm -hmm. 
they weren't trying to put it out of its misery. They weren't trying to be kind. Like he took those away before yeah. it was dead. And it, I, it had a couple of thoughts. One, wow, to have no natural predators yeah. is so cool. <laughs> it is so freaking cool. And that hasn't always been the case for humans because yep. there was a person that was in that situation within the last, I don't know, 50,000 years. I think 10 years ago, a chimpanzee ripped a guy's balls off. So it's still happening today. <laughs> so it still happens. Uh, but that's incredible. Thank God. Yeah. I'm really grateful. And second is that I often hear there's there's uh, this thrust when you read a number of books or in the paleo community that oh, we, I'm with you. we got to get back to how we evolved. We got to get back to the way things were. We no, all sit down too much. We Even people who are saying like humans, humans are ruining nature. <laughs> Like nature is beautiful and humanity is tarnishing it. Yes. I'm like, listen, I'm with you in the sense that we should fix the Brazilian rainforest. Yeah, you know, but that argument is weird. <laughs> nature is brutal. Yes. Nature is horrible at times. Like there's an asteroid. Vicious... I mentioned this that hit the earth and killed almost Way everything. Beyond that, most <laughs> things in nature are trying to kill other things in nature. Like, it's how they keep going. Yeah. 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 There's very. I mean, I guess there's some plants which just photosynthesize, which is great, but they'll starve each other out though. To, one, one plant will just jack all the sunlight from another. To not while it be a plant withers to, to not be a plant, meaning to herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, is to kill something living in order to sustain well, one's I'll do you own one better. life. Let's say people people think that plants don't count, right? Yeah. Fine. Whatever. I'll accept that. You showed me a video yeah. where a zebra finds another zebra <laughs> and it's a baby zebra. Yeah. And this male zebra doesn't know if it's his. Yeah. So in order to make sure that his genetics are the one that pass on, this adult zebra drowns a baby zebra. Not for food, just because f*** you, I want you to die. Yeah, and, and zebras uh, aren't good at drowning other zebras. <laughs> it takes a so it's a struggle. It's horrible. And it's, it's horrible. And I'm not saying I hate animals or I hate nature or anything. No, but just nature's rough. It's rough. Yeah. It's rough. It's a lot of dying. And and to, I think oftentimes you'll hear, why can't we be more like dogs? I've, I've heard people, you know, look how happy they are when you come home. They're just so kind. Even Dale Carnegie says, you know, be like the dog when he mm -hmm. wags his tail when you come home. And I have two dogs and we put a bone out and they both want the bone. And so I go, I know how to solve this problem. I'll get a second bone. Mm -hmm. I put a second bone out. And then they both try to capture both bones and, and hoard them while the other one suffers. I put a third bone out. There is never any, there's never enough bones for them both to be satisfied. And sometimes they'll just ignore the one, right? And exactly. Just try to get the they same will one. leave the, they like, my only point is that it's a rough world out there mm -hmm. and we are insulated from it. And I don't think that you can't find, you zoom out and find beauty in the circle of life and, and see that it all contributes to a larger thing, which is sure. spiritual in nature. Well, some people think that watching a lion dismember a wildebeest is beautiful. It is. And if in the sense, not is, I don't necessarily feel that, but I can, I can understand that perspective. If you see it as this holistic life begets life, destroys life, begets life unfolds, but it's harsh out there from my perspective. Yeah. And, and I don't suffer much physical pain nothing on that scale <laughs> yeah, yeah you skinned your knee in an escape room so i, I feel like you and that will be star boo -boo. <laughs> you're basically neck and neck in my opinion yeah so just really grateful for society i think this has also come up with china recently which is it's when things are good it's very easy to complain about the status quo as we should we should always try to get better but then you see what's you know and we complain about our police force mm -hmm. and we complain about that the way America is gone and then you see these protests in Hong Kong and you see what the Chinese government how they deal with protesters and you just go wow like I'm I'm grateful things could be better things, things could be worse could yes yeah. so that was just my thought I was like man it's it's rough outside I'm not going out there <laughs> <laughs> the outback is mean <laughs> and uh, last one that I have here this is an F transition I just thought it was fascinating so I stumbled across a video or something that was mentioning this whole Harvey Weinstein thing. Uh, and I did not know this. He hired a, a firm called Black Cube, which is an Israeli intelligence firm, to discredit his people that were putting stories out against him. Hmm. And one of the things that they did, and their website is incredible, it's got like, we have groundbreaking ways of obtaining information. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what they did. This is was, it's an Israeli company. It's an Israeli. It's ex-Israeli special forces. Special forces. Okay, dude. yeah. So they're hardcore. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, they've done some stuff. Yeah, 
and uh they're good at what they do yes they're like the guy from taken they have a special yeah. set of skills <laughs> a very special set of skills for sure and apparently what they did with rose mcgowan is because they didn't know what she had so they approached her to speak at a benefit which was not a real benefit mm. to get her to tell her side of the story at this benefit so that they could go about discrediting her and understanding what she was coming with <laughs> so they filled a room with fake people or i don't know if they, they actually paid? filled it i don't know if they went through with it but the, the the reporter was saying that they they approached her and did this it might have actually happened that she goes to this fake benefit and, and it's like harvey did all this horrible yep. stuff to me and, and they're just and recording so, it and they're, they're like so all they're, right this is what we have to discredit so just fascinating yeah. fascinating my again my my reaction to this is wow that's power that is what it is to be powerful is to be able to do just bury the truth yeah to be able to bury the truth which decent decent segue what and and i i do walk back some of what we talked about last time a lot of people were wrote very long things about our discussion about michael jackson did you see yeah yeah, yeah people so so people said that you know you got to look into x y and z and my standpoint is fortunately i i am not a juror and never will be for michael jackson and uh, the the I'll be honest, the impression that I have after watching Finding Neverland is pretty damning. But I well, recognize what you're saying is that our comment section was filled with other links yeah. to other videos that are discrediting those which which witnesses, which here's what I'm going to do. You're I'm Jon Snow and you know nothing. I'm going to not watch those yeah. and move on with my life, but recognize that my opinion on it is very uninformed, hasn't seen the other side, doesn't. Um, this is narrate. the hardest thing, the hardest thing that to do which is becoming more and more necessary in today's day and age is to not really have an opinion on much. Yeah. And it's, it's frustrating because one, your first reaction is to form an opinion. Yeah. It's never your first reaction to go, you know what? This is highly incendiary and upsets me. This is one side of the story. I'm yeah. going to assume this could be fake. <laughs> yeah. No, you just hear it. You have an emotional reaction and you go, this is my story. These are my and facts. So, yeah. And so, that just realizing like i can't have an opinion on anything mm -hmm. is really something that it's a lesson that i'm just having beaten into my head over and over and yeah. over again yeah. recently yeah so with regards to him and truthfully it doesn't matter what i think and i'm not gonna try to persuade anyone ever mm -hmm. on this because i recognize i've only seen the the accuser's perspective on it and i'm not interested enough to go research because what i think of it doesn't really matter my perspective was that when i saw them speak i was moved and uh, emotionally moved by what they said and have a sense that these things did occur, but, but would not indict. Was I there? <laughs> Certainly would wait for his defense in order to do so. Uh, and I would only form a full opinion after I heard his side, but I'm just not willing to dive too yeah, deep yeah. into it. Well, that's the other thing. Point. I mean, we've said this before, but you never get presented both sides because someone always does have yeah. cowspiracy, right? The guy pretends yeah. that he's going in with a certain curiosity yeah. unbiased curiosity but the guy was a vegan before he even made the movie yeah even when you think you're getting an unbiased perspective everybody's just coming in with their agenda yeah. and they're they're more concerned with making you perceive something a certain way than they are with trying to get to the bottom of the yeah. truth in a lot of cases at yeah least. and and it's i've always i found it hard with the the legal system because i was like man it's so strange to have a district attorney whose job is to say that you did it and to have defense attorneys whose job is to defend is even if it's not. a little weird right even if you even if you don't believe it is weird it, your job <laughs> when you're a defense attorney is not to get to the truth the mm -hmm. judge's job and the jury's job is to get the truth your job is to the best of your ability yeah. defend whoever your client is and yes. all you can control maybe is who your client is yeah that's if you're a partner at the firm yeah but once you sign up to be the defense attorney your job is to defend totally. as much as you can even if you think the guy's a total piece of shit or the girl's a total piece of shit, yeah. like it's that's interesting. I didn't realize that growing up. I thought the whole system was designed to. But there is a genius to the system, which is it recognizes there are two sides. Sure, and everything's biased. And the best thing we can do is give them both the chance to mm -hmm. do it. And even if you look at those individuals who are being all kinds of messed up, hopefully the the product of the system will yeah. be it will be justice. Uh, but yeah, so I, I did see that there were a lot of those. I looked at them. Uh, I have amended my my strong stance to a weak stance, an inkling, in, right. you know, if you will, just a an emotional bent in that way, which I I completely throw my hands up in the air when it goes time to say what truly happened. So you've changed, not changed my mind. You've exposed a weakness, a weakness that I fully admit to <laughs> at this point. Uh, then that was it for me. 
Um, all right, so Angel, fan questions. We have a call in. That's after. Yeah, I've got some calls as long as they answer. Okay. Um, but I do have a couple questions from YouTube as well. Yeah, let's do it. So Jim asks, I am a junior in high school. I wanted to know if you think dating is worth it at this age and why or why not. Should I focus more on developing myself, especially if I have no clue what I want in my life? Great podcast, by the way. You two are a funky bunch. Yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> bunch. I mean, you know, my opinion is if you don't have a serious relationship by the time you get out of junior high, you're pretty much screwed. So it's over. I don't know what your <laughs> what is your take. You might have a more... What is your take? Yeah, I was going to say sixth grade. If you're not... You're, all, you're <laughs> single and you're not, still alone. So jo all jokes aside, I would say date if you want to date Yeah, would be my opinion. You will be totally fine if you go all through all of junior high without yeah. dating. You'll be totally fine if you date a bunch in junior high. I would say don't put any pressure on it to mean anything would be my biggest piece of advice. Don't try to find your soulmate. If you find the person you're going to marry... That's awesome. Mm -hmm. If you date people and they make you happy and then they make you sad and you break up, that's awesome. If you decide that no one is someone you want to date, that's also mm -hmm. awesome. I would yeah. say if it's a low stakes game and it's the best thing you can do for yourself, because I do know people in junior high who go borderline suicidal when relationships end. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it changes it, but they're a junior in high school. So they're, school. they're probably high like school. 16, 17 ish, a little old. Same. Yeah. Same answer. Um, yeah, I, I would just do what makes you happy. Mm hmm. I would say that you're in a fantastic and will be for the next few years exploratory phase meaning if you're just really interested in magnets and want to just see how those things work for a while great you want to go into the woods like we did and chop down trees and make a little paintball fort great i did not date <laughs> if you want to date you're going to learn things about people mm -hmm. from that you are in an exploratory phase and it's completely appropriate for your age and for many more years. Yeah. So just do whatever you're interested in and learn from it. Yeah. You, but don't, you, you didn't date. I dated a bunch in high school as much as I possibly could, which wasn't a ton. But yeah, uh, we're in the same place <laughs> in terms of emotionally. And I think, uh, you know, our relationships now are not really affected by yeah that experience that much so weirdly enough i would say the only thing the only way to do things wrong i mean other than doing something horrible and committing a serious crime at this stage of your life is to try to do things so right that you ignore what you're interested in yeah that's the only way no, if or you to put a bunch of pressure on it that's yeah. that would be the biggest the biggest thing i would advise against that's the recipe to be upset and mm -hmm. to go down a bad path is if you decided that you had to have a girlfriend or had to not so that you had could, to be you could excel yeah. in in whatever other area so yeah yeah so someone you like yeah. is hanging out with you and you want to spend time with them but you go but you no, got to achieve because the most important thing <laughs> yeah. is my internship yeah, yeah, yeah or you whatever it is yeah i would say just do what makes you happy and doesn't horribly detract from your long-term goals whatever those are yeah you don't need to optimize right now that yeah. that can come don't do heroin that. like let's not only <laughs> let's not only solve for short-term <laughs> yeah, happiness yeah. but i think with dating you're probably in the clear explore use some birth control S sort of <laughs> yeah definitely use birth control <laughs> what else we got so jeff asks as an introvert my social energies drop after about 90 minutes of being in a group setting oftentimes when i'm at a longer event in my tank or when i'm at a longer event my tank hits empty what is a charismatic way to regain your energy, stay present, and continue to make a strong impression? Oftentimes, times my sorry, oftentimes with my energy, attention, and willpower down, I end up feeling defeated and reach for unhealthy food to get a jolt of energy. Hence, I am looking for, hence I am looking to overcome this unhealthy habit with a more empowering alternative. When taking a five-minute break in another room doesn't cut it. That's Maybe. a good question for you. You're an introvert. Well, I was going to say you kind of said it at the end. So two things that I think. I actually think the five-minute break is useful to me. And, and what I like to do is put no pressure on those five minutes and, and just be like, I'm going to sit here until I feel like standing. And then when I feel like standing, I'm going to come back. But as insofar as I'm sitting, I'm not going to smile. I'm not going to put on a face. I'm just going to allow myself to be. And so it sounds like that's something you've done. The other thing that I find people do is it's just a good state break is it's like a cliche from television. It's like water on your face in the sink. You know, you go into the bathroom, you splash some water and basically go Brr. that can, that can take you back. But I would uh, tune into what you actually want yeah. to do. So if you find yourself talking to people and you're like, I don't want to be talking to these people. What do you want to do? You want to sit on the couch? Do you want yeah. to take a walk? Do you want to do jumping jacks? I mean, what things you can do are jump up and down and dance that mm -hmm. might give you energy. It might tire you out. 
Like you can try to splash water on your face. I don't know if you want your face wet at this party. What's I would it, really just get in touch a, with what your actual desires are. And that's a good point because weirdly enough, some of the more charismatic moments and there's, and I, I don't want to advise people to not push yourself to be energetic. That's important. But there's times where I've been out like that and I've hit my threshold and I've stopped being as gregarious outgoing, but I've entered this mode of like, I'm willing to talk to someone one-on-one -on -one in a quiet way. But the place that I've hit emotionally is one of no longer caring. So when I do sit down with that person, I'm captivating in this weird, I don't feel social pressure way. So if you tune in and you find out like, I could go for a quiet conversation, or I could sit alone and I'm like, and you go do that thing that you feel like doing, you're not gonna necessarily be as magnetic as someone who's the life of the party, you know, talking to everybody, but there will still be something to that because you're, you're, uh, it's very authentic and it, it, it can bleed through. Well, you actually made me think of something. I think a great question or a great answer to a lot of questions is what is your goal, mm -hmm. right? So if you're out at an event, what is your goal? Is your goal to work on your charisma? You should push your comfort zone. You should see if you can get that 90 minutes to be two hours. Is your goal to connect with a good friend that you haven't seen in a while and you guys are at a bar and it's this guy you haven't seen in years? Spend most of your time talking to that person. Mm -hmm. Is your goal to have fun? Then, like I said, do what makes do you what? have fun. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to talk to these people. I want to go dance by myself like an idiot. That's exactly what you should do. Oh, I'm not having fun. I want to go home and play video games. <laughs> if the purpose of the night is to have fun, you should go home and just, yeah, I, I think it really first define why am I here? And then that will almost give you your answer of what mm -hmm. you should do, I think. Yeah, I agree. Cool. One more, uh, Fedge122NA. Uh, nice. Quite the username. I don't think it's a username. I think that's a uh, birth name. <laughs> <laughs> can you put numbers in a birth name? Yeah. <laughs> I think you can, actually. For sure. <laughs> there's ahead. people, yeah. My uh, my mom's friend worked at a hospital, and she said there's people who uh, thought that their daughter's name was Famale, uh, that the hospital had named their daughter for them. Yeah. Because it just said Famale. Yeah. So, so they became Famale. You can name your kid whatever you want. They became Famale? Well, I don't know. In some cases. Maybe. <laughs> So they ask, uh, how do you take a conversation you find dull and boring, turn it around and make it captivating? For instance, my wife talks about her job all the time. Mm. Work is such a big part of her life. The conversation continually ends up back at her job. As changing the topic is continuously a losing battle, <laughs> I figure I may as well lean into it. Any advice? I know why this person didn't use their real name when they first <laughs> My name is Ben Altman. I have a question. Uh, My wife is, is boring. boring me with their conversations. So what is, I so don't know that is, I how do you? The question is, how do you turn? A, how, how can I make this? She doesn't want to switch topics. She wants to talk about her work. She wants to talk about this thing. I'm not interested. I've tried to change it. I can't make her change topics. She and comes back to I'm this. I'm not interested in this topic. How do I learn to cultivate curiosity in this? I'm, yeah. This is tough because you can't, you're ideally since she's your wife you're not going to stop talking to her so you have to talk to her she does he say that she doesn't listen to his requests to talk about other stuff yeah it just says um uh so you have someone you care about who the conversation demands to talk about this topic yeah it just says uh changing the topic is a continuously a losing battle because they uh end up back at the job like they maybe switch but then it always goes back eventually pretty quickly yeah 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 so I, I don't have useful advice. I can tell you what I do. do this is not advice. I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't think anyone would do this because I don't have a wife. I say I don't want to hear about this anymore. And I find this boring. And I don't want to talk about it. And if she wants to tell me. And then I, I, well, here's uh, even zooming out. Men and women, I have noticed, as I think many have, <laughs> care about different things oftentimes. Communicate in different ways. Uh, what I would describe that I've seen in women that I've dated is they want to talk about their day, the blocking and tackling, who said what to who, and this. What I am more interested in is what we talk about on this podcast is abstractions, ideas, concepts. Yeah, which, I mean, in the case of your current girlfriend, is probably boring to her. Yes, and it often is. And there's times where I've <laughs> told her stuff that we talk about on the podcast. What were you talking about? We were talking about some of the experiments with the double slit experiment mm. and how that breaks our model of reality and how consciousness might form reality. And she's like, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, she say that? I don't care. My Good brain hurts. Yeah. And it's like, and, and it so that's was the relationship you guys have. You're both, you, you are both giving each other permission to just go, 
I don't care. Yes. Talk about something else. Yes. And then what we do is we laugh about the fact that I was like, look, just so you know, and you get it now. When I talk about this, this is how I feel when you talk about your day where, in my opinion, nothing happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so as, as boring as this is to you, that's what that is to me. So do you guys just give each other permission to be boring or do you try well, to minimize? Well, we give each other permission to be honest is the first thing. Sorry, but is the answer that sometimes you tell her about abstract things and sometimes she tells you about what things we, you find where boring? Where we or? actually click is no, we don't. She never just tells me, or very rarely will tell me the blocking, tackling in of her day. And I'm, I've never explained the double slit you come, experiment you to her. You come to other people for I come to other people for that. But where we meet is where there's an overlap. And obviously, I'm interested in people. So we talk about the people in her day in a way that I find interesting, hmm. which is like, you know, why, I wonder why she did that. Like, what could be going on in her life? Like, you like people and behavior I'm interested and in psychology. So what, you, what you would say for this person is what – is there any aspect of your wife's stories mm -hmm. or her job in general or the people she's talking about that you can have her able to share on that topic in a way that is more interesting to you? So, I, so she's guiding it to this thing of work. Can yeah. you guide it so your girlfriend will bring up her dad, her friend, her dad, whatever. Who and she saw literally, I went here, I went here, then I went here, and I yeah. went here. And, and to me, that is – You'll go, okay, we're going to yeah. talk about this. And then within this topic, I'm going to try to shift it to something I find the most interesting yes. within the spectrum. Yes. So she she often lays out the the uh, day <laughs> that she had, and I find in it the things that I that are psychologically appealing to me. Yeah. That somebody like then she said this to me, and there's there's an interest there. Like what mm -hmm. about what is going on with your relationship? Well, you wouldn't respond to anyone else like that. How come you got so heated? That becomes interesting to me. Yeah. I don't know that this is advice for anyone else. That just is. What I went with once was <laughs> just listen and be bored. Don't say anything. <laughs> die inside. And slowly, slowly just get used to not sharing your opinion or how you feel. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah. I would say don't go that route. I'm no longer dating that woman. I, I'll touch on some advice now, which I do think is advice. That's not a joke, by the way. I think that's what yeah. most people do. Well, based on is, that. Is just go. I don't like this, but I'm just going to listen and I'm going to listen endlessly yeah. and I'm not going to chime in. And now I've learned to ignore my own feelings and also not really and listen, to filter and to not listen, to sit here, to, yeah, to, yeah. to be physically present while I do like. And so here would be my advice is to find a where a light hearted way to express the truth which is i think that's one of the, the things that we do well is i can laugh at her when she starts this and she will laugh back because she sees where she's going and it can work in reverse as well where she go this is boring and my head hurts and i'll just be like i can't believe that i can't talk about this with you so find a light-hearted way to express that ah work my favorite <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah that's, and that's tailor fun. It, tailor it to your wife's sense of humor exactly that is fun and that you can both be in on this joke that you guys are different but it's not wrong that she's this way and then second would be to find elements within this this sphere that might interest you and and i i suspect that there there may indeed be more commonality if you're a fan of our channel and you listen to us that you could in the same way that an improv person will hear an audience suggestion of tree and then move into tree house, you know, create something different that you could take a leap from where she is. So it's still about a person in her life that she cares about, but it's coming from an angle that is interesting to you. So that's the best advice I can give. I don't have a great answer. I am very frank and I, and I know that that's hard to introduce into established that's relationships. That's the thing is most of my advice would be if this relationship were in the earlier days. Exactly. It's yeah, tougher once, once, once it's established. And you guys have your patterns. Yep. Yeah, I've never, I've never, I've never been married. Where am I? How, how can I, I can only postulate. <laughs> We're going to give, I can't give you experiential <laughs> advice. It's the truth. I can only, I can only hypothesize. Yeah. So, so this is some of the weakest advice we've ever given mm -hmm. is what I would say. As is anything with regards to marriage, because we've not been there. So good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can only guess. I can only say what I've done wrong. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think it's funny because we're going to do this video, you know, things we wish we knew about dating in, in our younger years. But I was realizing I have to give the caveat. I'm turning 32 and I'm unmarried, yeah. which is perfect for me. But if that's not what you want, a lot of this advice is probably not what you are looking for. Like to to take my advice is to presume that you are at least someone interested in arriving where I have arrived. 
otherwise it's 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 a perfect map to the wrong destination mm. so this is just an area where we i don't know the territory sorry <laughs> anything else that's it for the youtube questions thanks youtube questions all right Let's try this. Let's try this. Okay. Well, if the Headphones podcast on. if the podcast ends right now, it's because uh, we couldn't get a hold and we shot this four hours after and nobody was picking up. So have a wonderful day, everyone. We're going into We're going to try calls. to call people. Yeah. I haven't eaten any food today, so my brain is shutting off. Hello? Hello, hello. What's good, man? How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Is this Ben? Yeah, this is Ben. Awesome. This is Charlie. Is now a good time to chat? Absolutely. Perfect. Hello, Sarah. You got me as well. This is Ben, my uh, other Ben here. So yeah, we saw you had a question about uh, if you could sort of rephrase. You're you're selling stuff on a golf course, and you were asking questions about how to build trust. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Can you just run me? I mean, we kind of have the question in front of us, but if you don't mind, just state it again in sort of your own words. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I I run a a production company, um, and I make drone flyovers for golf courses. Okay. Now that means getting GMs, which is like a general manager and head pro, to basically give me permission to go shoot their course as like a sample clip, and then if they like what I do, then they buy a full flyover, and that's that's great. But Got the it. problem I'm running into is these guys kind of see me as like a leech. I feel like mm -hmm. somebody that that is on, that is I don't know. They typically these guys in their position that they're in don't like to be sold to. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a tough situation. I'm just trying to figure out how to establish a better rapport. Yeah. In a short amount of time because I don't really know these guys incredibly well when I walk in. But yeah. Got it. it. So I've got I got uh, a thought, but also before that a question. And is the first offer that you're making them is that it's that initial? Do you want the free sample? Is that the first thing that you're yeah. offering to them? Yes. Cool. So I think the best thing that you could do here is if you're finding that a lot of them are coming in with a predetermined notion like of who you are is to actually paste that and then lead it. So there's a thing called a double bind where you, uh, you, you essentially set them up so that either way they're agreeing with you in some sense. So you could walk in and say like, look, I bet you're thinking right now. Here comes another guy trying to sell me some ridiculous thing. You know, this this free sample is actually just a Trojan horse to try to steal my money. And quite frankly, you're totally right to think that. You know, there's a lot of people out here that do that. From my perspective, I'll tell you what. I only want to create something for you if it's actually going to be valuable to you. And we do the sample for that reason. So I completely understand if you have skepticism about this. But I'll tell you from where I'm coming from. I don't want to do business with anybody that isn't getting a ton of value out of this, which is why we offer this first free thing. The higher order point that I'm making there, though, which is, and again, I'm riffing off the top. I think the most important piece is to pace their reality at the beginning, which is if you find that there's resistance, hostility, etc., tell them that they're right for thinking that and address that proactively. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. No, yeah. I have, I've got Ben. I don't know if you have anything. I, yeah, I do. Um, yeah. The benefit of that is that either they're going to agree with you and go, yes, that is how I feel. But now they've started to agree with you. You're building rapport or they're going to go, no, that's not true. In which case what they've said is, no, that's not true. I trust you. So in mm -hmm. either way, you're going to be in good shape. Um, this is a random one, but do you have any numbers that show that what you do actually does add value? Because their concern is that you're just trying to take their time, waste their time, take their money and create something that's not going to be good for them. But if you could come in and be like, I've worked with these golf courses and since they started using my video, they've all doubled in revenue. I think you're going to answer a lot of their skepticism. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't have numbers yet. I don't know if I mentioned it. It's a pretty new production company. I just graduated college um, mm -hmm. and I'm, it's kind of a side hustle. I'm actually a professional golfer full time. But, oh, nice. Uh, Dope, this is, yeah, this is just kind of something to raise money on the side. To, Honestly? Uh, MCPs and whatnot. If it were me, I wouldn't do a free sample. I would just find a golf course and do it for free. I would go proof of concept, maybe ask them to cover your costs if you have costs, but I would just go, listen, I'm starting this company. I'm positive this is going to grow your business. I want to do it to you for free so that the next guy I pitch, I can tell him that I grew your numbers by this. And so all I want in return is just to get a, an honest look at your books and your revenue and so I can see how helpful this is. Because the truth is, if you're not selling something helpful, you're kind of screwed. But if you are selling something helpful, you're going to have a very big business. Yeah, the easiest the easiest sale to make in business is you give me money, I'll give you back more money. A harder sale is you give me money, I'll give you back a video. So what you need to learn how to connect 
and and this is the point that Ben's making is about proof. If you can be like, look, this is going to be X amount whatever today, and I've got one, two, three case studies of how you're going to make that money back the first week that this thing goes up or within the first whatever, and you actually have data that shows it, that's a very, very easy sale to make. And in addition, it also opens up your business, not that you would want to do this, to a number of other pricing arrangements, whereby if you know that you're generating them more money, you can set up, you know, boosts in sales or you could like if, if uh, you could do some sort of a profit share, which I know they want nothing to do with with some contractor, but it just gives you flexibility in terms of what you're offering. But I would really try to think, how can I create something where they give me money and I guarantee them that I give them back more and not how can I give them a cool video? Because that's gonna, that's the, the easiest sale to make in business is I'll give you more money. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Cool. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no sweat, man. I appreciate you uh, picking up, being our first caller. You're you're setting a world record, so thanks. thanks <laughs> oh, for no way. Up. That's oh. awesome. <laughs> I'm honored. We appreciate it, Ben. All right, man. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, we are out here, the listeners. We are out here. No, we Just appreciate so you know. it. We appreciate it. <laughs> We've decided that that you're our, our most favorite viewers, yeah, podcast I'm, viewers. I, I will no longer say that there's not a lot of you. There's there's the most important ones are out there. Exactly. They're it's worth not. It's not no one. It's the most important people in the world. They're worth ten thousand men. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an exactly. Army. It's the three hundred Spartans. I love it. Cool, man. All right. Have a great day. Yeah. You too. Thanks, guys. Take care. So we just hung up the phone on our dear friend Ben, and uh, yeah, I have another piece of advice that I had remembered and then forgot because <laughs> you were talking and he was talking. But Ben, the other thing is in sales, your offer is not for everyone, and so I think if you approach these golf courses and you start by asking questions, this is coming with the mindset that I want to help you, what you're doing, flyovers, I can help you get more clients. If that is something that is interesting to you, I'm your guy. If you are awash with clients and your failure is customer service, I'm not your guy. And I think that actually, weirdly enough, if you position yourself that way, it's more believable and it will feel stronger that you are a good solution if their issue is that they need more clients. Because mm -hmm. you're saying who you're not for and who you're for. Is and there any can... book that you think is the like, because I know you read a lot of books on sales and selling. Mm -hmm. Is there one that comes to mind? Prosperous Coach is great. Do you think that would that would convert well? I think so, man. Did you like spin selling? No. Never really got into it. Chet Holmes has a book, Ultimate yeah. Selling Machine. Never really got into it. There's a lot of stuff. Prosperous uh, Coach is good for general mindsets, and it will help you position yourself as the guy that's not for any everybody. Like, I th And that's a great point that you make is uh, when businesses don't have any clients, they try to appeal to everybody. Yeah. Instead, no, you're coming to this golf course. Yeah. You're saying, you're a golf course. You should hire me. They go, why? Mm -hmm. Versus if you go to them and you're like, Hey, I offer this drone thing. What we're really good for is golf courses that want new clients. Yeah. We are not good for helping with customer service. We're not good for lawn care. We're not good. Like we do one thing. Mm -hmm. It's get golf courses more clients. If you want more clients, we can help you out. And then you switch to the case studies I was saying. You're saying yeah. in the last three golf courses I've had this video go for, they've grown revenue 25% sure. immediately. And we might have even missed the bigger thing, which is if you're starting this business, the point that you made is uh, you, I'll even take you back a step you have a product decided already and you're trying to sell a product that you did not develop with the market in mind meaning if you go interview these golf courses none of them may tell you that what they want is a flyover video mm -hmm. but what they may say is i want clients and then you go back to the drawing board and you say what is the best way to get them clients yeah not as the, what's the best way to get them clients given that i own a drone yes but just i want to service maybe it's google golf ads courses. maybe it's maybe it's knocking on doors i don't know and if you decide it's drones then you can go back to them and say i know that you had said your issue is yep. getting clients i think that this will help and i'll do it for free sure and then once that works once then you go to the next guy you go i'm not going to do it for free yeah. you go you said your issue was clients i did this for a client they got 50 percent more revenue and I can do it for you. And I would recommend the book, if just for further reading on this, it's called Running Lean by mm -hmm. Ash Maria. And I'm not certain, because I think the point that we both miss is that this is a fledgling business. And what you might need to do is not sell better, but pivot and get a product that sells itself. Mm -hmm. And Running Lean is excellent for that. It's gonna give you the, we pivoted our entire business yeah. based on this but book. But at the highest level for any business, fledgling or not, yeah. you don't sell drone videos. You sell so increased yeah. clients. Yeah. Their issue is not that they don't have a drone video. Their issue is that they want more people on their golf course. Well, and also, stepping back, we are assuming that. 
we have never interviewed a golf course manager who knows what headaches what you're selling in any business is a happy you're you're selling happiness yeah, right if they don't want more clients <laughs> this and this is the thing you should, if they don't want more clients you should shut your business down right now yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah you need a totally different business because yes. then no one wants your job and maybe yeah. who knows what they want yeah uh, so you find out what they want and if they want more clients a that is possible what solution is drones but you figure forget, out the yeah, best forget. yeah that's just that's just a the methodology and yeah. no one really cares about we jumped a little we jumped in we i think this is a big thing that people do is uh assume that the question as it is phrased is the correct question mm -hmm. and i think the correct question is how should i validate a business idea yeah and the answer is you should do customer interviews mm -hmm. and then the product should sell itself and not rely on your sales expertise mm -hmm. uh so whoops <laughs> hope you watch ben help you watch you came ben. up with a better answer once you're off yeah, the phone. that's the truth. downside of being our first call yeah i think uh, keep them on the phone a little bit have them have us talk it out have a longer less succinct call next sure, time sure sure we had we had a lot of people submit questions internationally we appreciate that we didn't have the tech set up to call international people so we're gonna set that up for next week and we goofed on the time which is our bad so mm -hmm. next time submit your question and your name and your number and we will text you beforehand you submit them you go to the description google, correct google and you click form you the click the google yep. form and so we will text you and we will let you know hey we're gonna give you a call in a couple minutes and that way when you get a call from an unknown number you know that it's not a scam it's us it's both a scam and it's us <laughs> <laughs> just listen you want charisma advice i want your social security number we both have something we can trade that we can give the other just one. the last four all right guys and take the care other numbers have a wonderful week Goodbye. peace